Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 306 of our Bible study review. Today, we're going through chapters four through six of the Gospel of Luke. So yesterday in chapter three, we left off with the baptism of our Messiah, and then it went into Joseph, right? His stepfather, so to speak. Um, it went over his genealogy. So now in chapter four, it's going back to focusing on the Messiah and how he was led by the Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. And we see that in the last day, right? The last day where our Messiah is definitely, he's struggling, he's hungry. And so Satan comes to tempt him right at the very end, right as he's about to finish his race by over coming in the wilderness for 40 days. So he comes to him first to tempt him with the lust of the flesh. We see this in Matthew chapter four. And the next thing that he does, he takes him up on a high hill and he says, look, all of these kingdoms I will give to you. I have the authority to give them unto whoever I please. And that is the truth because the first Adam handed the keys over. He handed the lease over to Satan. So here is Satan and he recognizes who Yeshua is, right? And he says, look, if you just bow down to me, if you just worship me, then I'll give you all of these kingdoms. And our Messiah shuts him down with the written word. What are these wicked kingdoms doing now in the earth, right? They're all fighting for power to rule over the earth. And that's exactly what Satan was trying to tempt Yeshua with. And he was like, nah, <laughs> you don't know that all of this is mine anyways. So the next temptation is the pride of life. I want you to see how Satan goes to try to attack Yeshua's identity. Our Messiah had responded to him twice. It is written. And so I want you to see how Satan also comes to him saying what is written. Satan knows the scriptures better than most so-called professing Christians. All right, let's read of this account in verse nine. It says, he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of Elohim, throw yourself down from here for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning you to preserve you and in their hands, they shall hold you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Yeshua answered him, it is said, you shall not tempt Yahuwah, your Elohim. And when the devil had ended all of his temptations, he departed from him until another time. You see, our Messiah has no reason to prove who he is to Satan. Satan knew who he was because he was in the kingdom before he fell away. So he knows exactly who he is. And so our Messiah had the ability to call down the angels if he wanted to. He had the ability to do all of these things, but then he would forfeit, right? Being our salvation. He would forfeit covering us. So our Messiah always came back with the written word and he knew who he was. So he didn't have to prove it to this loser. After this, it records that Yeshua goes back to his hometown in the Galilean territory and he goes into their synagogues and he starts reading. Let's read about it. Starting in verse 16, it says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. When he had unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of Yahuwah is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of Yahuwah. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all of those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is filled in your hearing. All bore witness to him and wondered at the gracious words which came out of his mouth. Then they said, is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, you will surely say to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. He also said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truthfully, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were closed for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all of the land. Yet to none of them was Elijah sent except Zarephath, a city in Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, but none of them was cleansed except Naaman 
the Syrian. All those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. They rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down the head long. But passing through the midst of them, he went his way. And so they were denying who he was because he was brought up with them. And he said, look, the same was true with ancient Israel. Many of them could not be healed. Many of them could not be cleansed because of the prophets who grew up in their own regions. They had to go outside of their regions and those outside of the regions believed on them, but those who grew up with them would not. And so he's basically saying, you're just like them. Miracles cannot be done here. Many cannot be cleansed here because of your un." belief because you do not recognize a prophet in your midst. The prophet of all prophets, matter of a fact. Verses 31 through 37 give the account again of how our Messiah went into the synagogues of Capernaum and he healed this man with an unclean spirit. This man was sitting in the synagogue having a demon and the demon cried out because he felt and he saw the anointed one. Afterwards, it gives the account again of Simon Peter's mother-in-law of how she was suffering with a fever. She was suffering with illness and our Messiah rebuked it and it left her body. And it gives the account of how he was basically casting out all of these demons throughout that region. And let's close out the summary of chapter four with verses 42 through 44. It says, when it was day, he departed and went into a remote place and he's still in Galilee. It says, and searching for him, the people came to him and tried to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of Elohim to other cities also, for this is why I was sent. Chapter 5 opens up and we see that our Messiah is preaching the word of Yah from inside of a boat. And once he was done preaching, he then goes after his first disciples. We know Simon, who is later called Peter or Kepha, and then the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Let's pick up in verse four. It says, when he had finished speaking, he had said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered him, master, we have worked all night and have caught nothing, but at your word, I will let down the net. When they had done this, they had caught a great number of fish and their net was tearing. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come up and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Place yourself in Simon Peter's shoes. You're doing what you know how to do best. You're a professional at what you do and you're failing. And here comes someone who is preaching the word of Yah and he's preaching with authority. And he tells you, look, do it one more time. Do it at my command. And when they do, their boats are filled to the point of sinking. Come on, somebody. When you keep his word and you guard his commands, blessings follow. That's not being legalistic, y'all. That's obeying the word of Yah. Blessings are tied to obedience. Stop thinking that this is legalistic. He's the ultimate father and our Messiah is his messenger. Now think about your parents when you were young. If you did not obey their words, did you get blessings or did you get punished? Take that and apply it on a grand scale because he is the father of all fathers. All right, back to the text. In verse eight, it says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at the knees of Yeshua. And he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Adon. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, which they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Yeshua said to Simon, who is later called Peter, do not fear, from now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything to follow him. Let that speak to you. You may recall the account of verses 12 through 15 when our Messiah cleanses a leper and then he tells him, look, tell no one, go to the priests, right? Show yourself clean and make your offering. But we know that the leper does the opposite. He goes and tells everyone of how he has been cleansed of this thing that nobody else can cleanse him of. The next portion, which goes all the way down to verse 26, recounts the way this paralytic man had friends who brought him down from a rooftop. And then he told him, look, your sins are forgiven you, right? And then the Pharisees, those who were around said, who is this? 
who is speaking these blasphemies? Who is it but God alone who can forgive the sins of people? And so our Messiah says, which is easier? Your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk. And the last part of chapter 5 tells us that our Messiah goes to take Levi, aka Matthew, the tax collector, which he was deemed the sinner of sinners amongst his people against the brethren because he was collecting taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire against his people. And so our Messiah says, look, come and follow me. And Matthew was like, bet. I will. And so because Matthew had such a grateful heart, he threw a feast for the Messiah. But he brought all of his tax collector friends and all of the sinners with him. And we know that the scribes and the Pharisees, they murmured against themselves, saying, why does he eat with sinners? And our Messiah responded. He says, look, the sick, they need a physician. He goes, look, I've come to bring the sinners to repentance. I have not come for the righteous. I haven't come for those who think they've got it all together. Now, of course, that's not verbatim. I'm just summarizing. And the last portion of chapter five, we have read about and other gospel accounts where the Pharisees and the scribes, they're asking why the disciples of Yeshua do not fast while the disciples of John and the Pharisees and the scribes, they fast often. And then our Messiah responds to them, look, when the bridegroom is with them, why shall they fast? When the bridegroom is taken away, it's then that they will fast. And then our Messiah tells the parable of the old cloth and the new cloth coming together and how it tears. It's not fit. And then he talks about new wine being poured into old wine skins and how if you do that, it would burst Forth. And of course, he's talking about the fact that he's bringing the newness of the promises that are foretold in the old. Chapter 6 opens up mirroring exactly what happened in Matthew chapter 12 concerning the Messiah walking on the Sabbath with the disciples, plucking the heads of grain, and there was opposition set against them. Please go back to day 296 to see about this topic in depth as well as the topic with the man with the withered hand inside of the synagogues. Please go back and review that because it's the same exact thing that is happening right here. As you pick up in verses 12 through 16, you will see that all 12 disciples are chosen at this point. 12 tribes, 12 disciples. You're seeing the patterns, right? Verse 17, he came down with them and stood on a level place with the crowd of his disciples and a great crowd of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him to be healed of their diseases, including those who were vexed by unclean spirits. And they were healed. The whole crowd tried to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Our Messiah then speaks of the blessings and woes directly on his disciples. He's speaking to them as he has his eyes on them. And he says, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of Elohim. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they separate you from their company and insult you and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Those were the blessings that he's speaking to the disciples because he knows the work and he knows the persecution that is coming for them. So he tells them in verse 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner, their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are filled, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so their fathers spoke of the false prophets. Then our Messiah teaches how to be perfect like the Father. It's about loving your enemies. And so it says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer also the other. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic as well. Give to everyone who asks of you, and to him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. For if you love those who love you, what thanks do you receive? For even sinners love those who love him. If you do good to those who do good to you, what thanks do you receive? For even sinners 
do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what thanks do you receive? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much in return, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful, even as your father is merciful. Our Messiah is showing them the characteristics of the Father, to be merciful and to be kind and to do good even when people are evil. You see, once we were enemies of Yah before we came to his son, but when we were enemies of him, he still loved us. He still sent his son to sacrifice him so that we might be saved. That is the mercy and love of the Father. Later on, we will see that the disciples asked the Messiah, show us the Father. And this is an example right here. He's like, look, I'm showing you the Father. I'm showing you who he is. He is spirit and I'm showing you his character. Not only was he speaking about it, but he was the walking, talking example. Then our Messiah speaks about judging others. He says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will men give unto you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. And so he's saying, look, be heavy with the forgiveness. Be heavy with that. Don't be heavy with the judgment because he has forgiven you so much. He continues to speak. Let's pick up in verse 39. He spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a ditch? The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is trained will be like his teacher. Our Messiah is saying, if I suffer on account of righteousness, so shall you. And nonetheless, you shall forgive. Basically, this is what he's saying. All right, let's pick up in verse 41. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not see the beam that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the beam that is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, remove the beam from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. He's saying, check yourself first. Before you go out looking for the sins of others, ask the Father to seek you first. Cleanse your temple first before you look outward to others. Then our Messiah teaches about a tree and its fruit. So let's read about it in verse 43, it says, a good tree does not bear corrupt fruit, nor does a corrupt tree bear good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a wild bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bears what is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bears what is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. All of us are likened unto trees and what you put on the inside is what you get out this is why we are called to be renewed right by the word words are spirit and he's saying fill yourself with my word that way i may fill you with the good treasure i may fill you so that you could produce good fruit and as we read this last portion please imagine that the messiah is speaking to you in the here and now he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show him who he is like. He is like a man who built his house and dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against him, but could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But he who hears and does not obey, obey what? his words, his commands. It says, he is a man who has built his house on the ground without a foundation against which the stream will beat against violently. Immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Deep and Word family, I hope that this Bible study is helping you to tie up every loose end and you see the purpose of our Messiah is not just salvation and paying for our sins, but now he has come to transfer something. He has come to give us the spirit that would cause us to obey and walk in his commands. What is sin but transgression of the father's commands? So he gave us a spirit 
a spirit that wants to obey. And he is the example of teaching us how to obey the Father perfectly. Many still call him Lord, Lord, but they don't do what he says. And in a result of that, he will say to many who say, Lord, Lord, depart from me. I don't know you. I truly hope that you're starting to wake up to the truth of scripture so that you may be found worthy to escape the troubles that are coming. Deep Inward Family, that's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow, Yah bless.